Familiar with at least you know the the basics of anatomy. Uh, I I am going to make, hopefully focus mostly on the navigation, and as I'm going through the navigation of a volume, uh, be discussing the uh, uh, the anatomy. But then also a key part is improving your CVCT uh, images. I'm not going to be talking much about the basics. I don't know where everyone's knowledge is when it does come to cone beam CT. Um, but let's just pretend it's magic. You put the patient in there, you press a button, and you get a cone beam uh, image after that. The one thing that a lot of people don't understand or miss, and you probably haven't seen these values since dental school, but the KDP and MA, it actually is crucial when it comes to cone beam CT. You got you to think, if, you have, if you're just taking a PA and these numbers are all over the place, um, it doesn't matter. If it's digital, you can go to the computer, you can adjust the, adjust the contrast, adjust the brightness, and you know, the, the image is still going to be diagnostic. You're still going to be able to see those E1, E2s. With cone beam CT, though, and, and the best example, I'm not going to talk about the physics of it, but the best example is, let's say you have two patients. The first patient comes in, 22-year-olds, wants to get third molars extracted. You, you know, they have no restorations, no implants, you know, young guy. Um, and so the patient comes in, most machines have that function. You know, childs, uh, female, male. And so you press the male button, you press the button, take a scan, you look at the image, and it's going to look perfect. It's going to be amazing. No scattered, no problems. And, you know, everything's diagnostic. You're going to see those, you know, the roots of uh, the, the third molars, mandibular canal, no problem. Now that second patient comes in, six-year-old male. He's got two implants, gold restorations, amalgam, PFMs, all over the place. And then you, you, you press that same button, press you know, the, the male, scan them, and you look at the volume, and it's going to be a disaster. There's going to be scatter. There's going to be beam hardening. So this is where you, know, this is where you want to bump up that KVP and that MA. And it'd be the same instant, like if there's a female that comes in and she's, you know, heavier set, you know, maybe larger than the males you saw that day. Why would you hit the female button? You would hit the male button because you want to bump up that KVP in the MA. Now, a lot of these softwares and a lot of these companies now have um, these algorithms that say, oh, it'll, it'll take out the beam hardening. But that's actually not solving the problem. That's actually just sugarcoating it. There, it it's just... Um, you know, it's making it look pretty, but it's not really solving the problem. So I just want to keep that really in mind. Um, KVP MA, if you have someone with law of restorations that you know is coming in, or he has a few implants, wants another implant, just bump up those values a little bit. Really, really key. Now, when it comes to voxel size, this is another one of those mis uh, misconceptions, I think. Um, you know, if, if a patient's coming in, and you know, the, it's for endo treatment or single arch um, uh, implants, there's no reason to do a full head scan. You know, you can, but the resolution is gonna be a lot, lot better if you do a smaller scan. Um, you know, especially if there's a patient that uh, is getting retreatments, a patient that potentially has a fractured tooth, uh, you want that small, small volume. You'd be surprised, some of these machines now can get down to 80 uh, microns versus that large scan at 15 by 15, I don't know many machines that can get behind, you know, below 300 microns. So you're, you're looking at significant drop in, in the image quality and, and resolution. Um, of course, if you're doing airway, TMJ, yes, you know, do, do that large volume. Uh, endo, you know, try to keep to the small. For me, if, you know, for the general dentist doing, you know, normal practice, my magic number in my area is really, I think that 8 by 8, 10 by 10 is the best. Uh, even a large male, you know, with maybe third, third molar still impacted, you know, you're going to catch everything in an eight by eight, 10 by 10. Um, and also don't forget, you know, you want to avoid those incidental findings and you're not going to have incidental findings, you know, in that eight by eight, 10 by 10, because you're really just focusing on the, um, uh, dental alveolar, uh, area and you're not, you're avoiding that, you know, the cervical vertebrae, you're avoiding, uh, you know, the, the, you know, calvarium. So just to keep that in mind. Uh, other really important points to improve image quality um, really is patient positioning. I'm telling you, this is, to me, this is the, the most important one. And of course, I consider it the most important because, you know, me as a dental radiologist, when I get a volume 
and it's already set and I don't have to adjust it, you know, left and right to, uh, you know, see if it's uh, symmetrical. Pa patient positioning, you put that patient in there, you know, symmetrical, you put that patient in there where they're comfortable, you know, if there's places for them to hold on to, perfect. If that's adjusted to the perfect height, perfect. Because then you're also going to avoid patient movement. If that patient's in there kind of crooked, uncomfortable, you know, as that machine's going around, they might just adjust themselves. And that leads really segues perfectly into the patient movement. If your machine has the capabilities to stabilize that patient, spend that 10 seconds to strap their head in, you know, um, spend that extra minutes to, you know, if there's a bite block, make, you know, make them uh, uh, bite onto it. Um, cutting off crucial anatomy. This happens quite often. Um, and this really, you know, applies with the, the fifth points, but always double check the volume. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I'm not calling anyone out or, or saying anything, but like, you know, I, I sometimes get, oh, hey, you know, check the TMJ and it was actually, you know, an eight by eight. So the TMJ is not even in there. Um, and, and, and that also segues into the fourth point, who's pressing the button? Uh, I know maybe a handful, maybe 1% of you might be, you know, taking that scan yourself. The majority of people have their assistants or someone else pressing that button to take that scan. And you know you, you don't always have the same dental assistant. There's you know there's there's always a turnover. So who's training who? You know if they they have bad habits at the beginning, they'll always have bad habits, and they'll be training the next person with bad habits. So if there ever is an issue, and if you know implant concierge, use us as a resource. You know, tell your assistant or call us yourself. You know we offer free training. Call one of our customer service. We know almost every machine out there on the market. And we can, you know, we, we have the protocols for them. Uh, we can, you know, show, explain how to use it, how to do, get a better image, um, you know, provide this potential PowerPoint, you know, to, to, to assist them. And also um, so that they can train the next people onwards, uh, you know, how, how to take a scan. And that also includes if you're doing implants with us or surgical guides, uh, we can show them and also you how to do, a, you know, a proper uh, you know, dual scan protocols and so forth. Uh, this image on the bottom, um, I really want to show you, like, this, this, it looks awful, doesn't it? You know, there's a lot of, it looks like scatter, you know, this and that. You know, do you think there's movement? And I get this question a lot. You know, is this passable as something that is diagnostic? Can you see the dentition? No. Can you see the canals? No. But was there movement? And just so you guys have this in the back of your mind, this is this is really crucial. This is my go-to. Now, if you don't have the maxilla, you know, in the scan, then you know there's other anatomical areas that you can look for, and I'm not going to get into that now. But right here, you get an axial slice of the maxillary sinuses, and it looks like that. That's there. There was no movement. This that was a perfect scan. If you have such contrast between the air and the maxillary sinuses. The bone being perfectly thin and continuous and, you know, bone-like, and then the soft tissue, there, there was no movement. So, you know, just, just keep those, you know, those small things in mind. All right. So this doesn't directly, you know, relate to, you know, this topic, but I just really wanted to show you guys, you know, the power of cone beam CT and like what we have in our hands. You know, you got to imagine 10, 15 years ago, what, what maybe one to 5% of dentists um, you know, had had a cone beam, and now how many have it? You know, it, it's what 40, 50 percent maybe. Uh, but really, you know, we didn't go from you know panoramic to something else to something else, and finally cone beam. No, we went from panoramic light speeds ahead to now cone beam CT. Um, and the real fault flaw with the the panoramic was the source uh, of the beam, as you can see in the image, is at a negative angle to the the film. So anything that's lingual. Uh, so closer to the source is always going to project higher in the image and everything buckle or further away from, you know, the point that you're interested in is always going to project higher. And I don't want to get into too many personal stories, but this one is, uh, relates to me very well. In dental school, I had a bad experience with a third molar. Extraction. And... <clears throat> I absolutely hated them. You know, I, that would, became my scope of practice. You know, everyone has their own scope of practice, you know, and I just refuse to do them. There, there could be, you know, a two year old coming in with, you know, fully erupted third molars. I just wouldn't touch them. I'd rather just prefer it. And it wasn't until cone beam CT that I was like, oh, wow, you know, maybe I would challenge this tooth and I'll explain to you why. 
I challenge you, if you have, let's say you just find 10 patients that you have a panoramic of, that you extracted third molars or any tooth uh, in the, uh, the mandible and a cone beam of it, and I will tell you that 50% or more of those mandibular canals or the third molars are going to be touching or within the mandibular canal and the panoramic. Now, if you look at the cone beams of those same images, if 1%, I, I doubt uh, 10 out of 10, you won't find it, you know, maybe, you know, of 10 dentists, one will find it, but it's just shocking that, you know, uh, you know, the, the technology and the power that we have with cone beam CT and how it applies to, you know, not just extractions, but like implantology and everything else, endodontics, it's, it's incredible. All right, this is my opportunity to play a little game. You know, if, if you want to put in the message board, if, if you know what's going on, go ahead. If, if you just want to keep a little mental note, um, but do you guys see anything in the right mandible? So between 29 and 31. Now, the, the next example I'm going to have is it's going to be a lot better. This, this one, I'm just going from pano to home beam. But there it is. It's a root tip, you know. In your differential diagnosis on that panoramic and even on a PA, you might say it was idiopathic osteosclerosis. You might say uh, cemental osseous dysplasia. But no, it's it's clearly a root tip. And so that is in your notes now. That's, you know, whatever software you use, Dentrix, and in the future, if something happens, that was in your notes. That was a root tip. This, it, this one, uh, specifically, you actually, uh, if I had another cross-section of it, you could still see there was a canal. So a canal means it's not calcified, which means that there's still tissue in there, which means if all of a sudden there is an issue in that area, and you take a PA, you know, that, that tissue could have gone necrotic. And, you know, now you have an issue. Instead of just trying to guess what it is, you know, you, you already knew it was... Uh, uh, root, uh, root tip. Okay, another one. Anterior maxilla. So what do we see here? So number four slash five, most likely it's, it's uh, four, is fractured. Number 10, root canal treated. And Dr. Morchat, there's a, there's a bit of a delay from when you present and when the questions roll in. So we can give them a couple seconds just because you uh, gave the answer away before some questions came in for the last one. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. So you guys can see the image. I'll give you guys a few seconds to think about what it might be. I do have PAs, so I'll present that now. Okay. So now you can see number 10 is endodontically treated. You can see number nine is endodontically treated. You can see that there's a fistula. That's why there's good aperture there. I'm assuming that you, I, that this is one of my cases. I, I just, you know, you know, does the, does the fistula go all the way into the area? And so, so what would your, we have a root tip number 19 residual infection, likely a missed canal. Okay. Good, good answer. But we're looking at anterior maxilla, but it, that's, that's very, <laughs> as well as the correct answer. I have a resorb number nine, failing endo on number nine. Okay, so what would the diagnosis be? Not even, not even diagnosis, I'm sorry. What would the treatment be? That's why I wanna know. What would be the treatment at this point? But we're having several uh, answers for extraction, possible biopsy, uh, retrofill and bone graft, more extractions, uh, retreating the root canal. Or, okay. uh, the, the retreatment. So don't forget, I, I went to dental school. My clinical experience, I only worked for three years. So it's not as good as, you know, of course, uh, potentially majority of the dentists here. But for me, my, my go-to would have been retreatment or extraction, of course. But whoever said biopsy, very close. Look at that. Uh, I know there's a delay, so. But that is a cyst. So again, my answer being absolutely the worst answer, retreatment, you could retreat that 100 times and that will never go away. A cyst if you guys don't remember, has an epithelial lining around it. 
So that means retreatment is never going to get rid of that, that lining. Extraction, yes, that's, that's a good option because, you know, that's going to drain. But also that tooth could potentially be saved now that we have the cone beam CT. You know, break a little window in there, curatage it out, retrofill. Like whoever said that, that was, that was a great answer. That's actually one that I, I myself never thought of or have heard of. Uh, but that, that's definitely a great answer. That's probably endodontics. That's why. Um, but that, you know, we, we know exactly what's going on there, which is, which is fantastic. Okay. So did anyone see anything else in the anterior maxilla? Mandible. I'm sorry. That should say maxilla. It's the anterior maxilla. I've only gone over this presentation like 30 times. I don't understand how I didn't catch until now. So I'll show the image. So it's number six. What do people think that is? Let's hear some answers, Andy. So we have some internal resorption, possible root resorption. Uh, internal resorption seems to be the popular answer right now. It's totally correct. It is resorption. Um, its location and its presentation being vertical uh, along the dentin uh, kind of changes a potential diagnosis. Don't forget, like it, resorption is resorption. It's like a cyst is a cyst, but there's a diff there's a hundred different types of cysts, but really, a, you know, it's kind of the same thing. So, you know, resorption is the correct answer. And I'm going to show you now in uh, cone beam CT how different it looks. Now, you know, went from something that was small that you might have just left, you might still leave this, but now like that, that, that's incredible. Like, look at the size of that. So that's something now you note. And so when the patient comes in, you know, every time they come in for a recall or whatever, you know, now you're at the point where you should be taking a PA each time or even refer to endodontists. Endodontists are fantastic at this. Uh, I'm not sure there's some in the, in the audience, but they have a four stage um, structure, whatever you want to call, you know, being, you know, zero being the, uh, you know, the, the best uh, prognosis versus four being the worst. And it, you know, depends how severe it is. Uh, the reason that invasive cervical resorption was considered here was because of its location. Now, in the cross sections, we don't have a perfect example, but it being in the, you know, along the long axis of the canal. And you can see, if I use my pointer here, you can see actually the outline of the canal and not being interrupted. So that's one finding that you do find with invasive cervical resorption. And number two, its location close to the CEJ or along the CEJ. And again, we don't have all the cross sections here to show that it, it was uh, in one cross section uh, that close. You can see it in this image here in the very first one, you know, there's the avular ridge and you can see that it is at that level. Okay. So, Okay, make sure there's not too much of a delay. Okay, so I want you guys to understand, I do not believe in the scare tactic being an oral maxillary radiologist. Oh, you, you know, you get a cone beam, you should send everything to me. Absolutely not. Um, I believe that, you know, it's within your scope of practice or not. There's some dentists that, you know, they're, they're, their lives are so busy, you know, why would they spend an hour doing a radiology report themselves uh, when they can send it out, when they can spend, you know, make two thousand dollars in the chair, you know, uh, does a radial, does a CVCT have to be reviewed? Yes, you know, it should be noted in, in the notes. Yes, like the ADA does say that every X-ray uh, has to be recorded, and and it's a fact because you take a panoramic, you take a PA, uh, and all of them are recorded in, in notes, and so it does apply to cone CT. So some dentists will be comfortable enough that in five minutes or less. You know, they can load that cone beam CT, they can scroll through it, see there's no pathology and move on. But then there's others that it's like, it's, you know, it's not worth my time. I, I don't want to bother with it. And that, that's another kind of dentist. Um, now, when, when it comes to this study, this was done with uh, ortho. So you got to imagine this is a full head scan. So we're going from like C5 potentially all the way to above the frontal sinus. Um, and here, of course, 
it, you're going to find a lot more incidental findings. So here you can see almost two incidental findings per report, which is shocking. Uh, the biggest one being airway, and I hope you guys know that that's that's the hottest topic now. You know, we're we're starting to realize, you know, we as dentists have the capability to help patients, and the the field of dentistry is changing because you know we're we're now changing the way we practice because airway is becoming such an issue, and because we are there to diagnose those issues firsthand. Um, now, I'll go over, you know, in, in the volume, you know, the different findings you will have, you know, airway can include anything from enlarged uh, tonsils to constricted airway and so forth. Perinesal sinuses, not surprising, you know, which patient doesn't have sinusitis or, you know, mucositis, and especially, you know, we're here in South Texas, uh, I, I think, you know, it's 100% of the population. Um, the biggest one I want to point out to you is the dental alveolar being 15%. That's incidental finding. So that was something they, that was not in the dental charts and was just found. We can talk about fractures. We can talk about periapical lesions, uh, widened PDLs. So what a point I want to make with this one is if you're a general dentist and you don't have a cone beam, okay. Now that, let's say you refer uh, for uh, implant. So you send it to your, your implantologist. I see that's me controlling the mouse. You refer to the implantologist and he's got a cone beam. He takes a scan and, you know, you refer to him. He's going to send that patient back. He's going to want that uh, crown put on that implant. But he sends you a report now and says, oh, you know, number three has a, you know, pretty widened periodontal ligament space. That's, you know, not in the notes. And to you as the general dentist or even to me when I practice, it's like you caught something I didn't see that potentially could three months down the road blow up. I'm just going to have to take a PA, you know, follow up with the patient, you know, maybe do a vitality test right then and there. And in the future, uh, you know, save the patient maybe pain in the chair and also give them confidence that, you know, you, you, you found these things. And, and I just think it's this beautiful referral system that we have in dentistry that's really growing. Uh, we have so many of these subspecialties, especially with airway. Um, you know, I, I really see the multidisciplinary uh, power that uh, dentistry is really growing into, you know, and I, I think you guys, you know, probably see that as, as well yourselves. So, Dr. Um, Morchek, we have a question asking what percentage of the incidental findings are clinically significant? All of these were pathological, not abnormals. So, it, like, it, I, I'll send the, the, it's really, really small. I'm not sure you can even read what it says down there. But here's an example, and I know this for a fact for the paranasal sinuses. Airway, I'm actually a little iffy about because that seems like a very large number. Uh, but for the paranasal sinuses, something like a mucus retention pseudocyst was not counted because that's not, you know, pathological. And it, mild mucositis, you know, not. But, you know, moderate severe sinusitis, you know, chronic sinusitis, you know, acute sinusitis, those were all included. So clinically relevant, and, and you'd have to admit that it kind of this, just the pie chart kind of proves it, because if you look at TMJ, you know, that really falls into the number of people. If you're thinking about all the people that you know, have uh, uh, TMJ problems, that's around the range that you're looking at. If that TMJ number was all of a sudden like 35, then you know, they'd be including remodeling. But that, that's, you know, that's degenerative, including the cervical vertebrae. So, so the follow-up question um, that we're receiving to that is, are these findings, um, do you mean these findings in the sense that they require treatment? In some fashion, yes. How extensive? Again, you know, sinusitis, you know, can be treated with simple antibiotics. Airway, on the other hand, you know, might, you know, tonsil surgical removal uh, could be just CPAP. So, yes, they, they would have to have some intervention. Uh, and, and maybe I should make the point that, you know, when we have a radiology report uh, and we do have a finding, um, you know, as board certified and anyone that is board certified, a big portion of our boards is not just, oh, I found a, a, a finding. It's the management. What is your what is the next step you should do? You know, if there's severe constricted airway, I'm not just going to say, cons you know, severe constricted airway. What is the management that should be referral to ENT? You know. Um, the only exception would be dental alveolar, uh, because I can give you a prog, 
I won't even give you a prognosis. I'll give you a diagnosis, like persistent rarefying osteitis. I'm not going to tell you, you know, that that's when it comes to the oral cavity, that's that's the dentist's job to decide there. But TMJ, you know, referral, cervical vertebrae depends on the severity and the patient's age. You know, this is there, there's it is multi, multi facet, if that's the right term. Um, discussing standard of care. So the AA, OMR, and the AAE, um, basically they've come out with a joint statement that um, it is considered a standard of care. The second point I used to have up there on the PowerPoint was not to be consider considered routine. And it, it, it gets so many people frustrated and it'd be like, I, I don't understand. How can it be standard of care but not considered routine? So the point is, if a patient comes in, and we're just we're just going, let's talk about endodontists, okay? Patient comes into the endodontist and says, "Hey, I got pain on uh, number three, never been re uh, treated," and he takes a cone beam. That's considered routine. That should have not been done. But if it's now a referral to him from a general dentist because abnormal anatomy, potentially missed or can't find the NB2 um, fracture retreatments. Those are all necessary and considered standard of care uh, scans that should be done. Um, and, you know, I, I've, I've had a few, you know, dentists call me regarding, you know, contacting the board because of weird situations. Uh, but, you know, it, when it goes to, you know, court, if you retreated a tooth and the tooth's fractured and all of a sudden the patient needs a $5,000 implant and they're questioning why, and then it comes out that, you know, cone beam was never taken and, Anyways, you know, you can go down the, the rabbit hole all day long. And, and uh, you know, when, when it comes to certain situations, you know, that that is it is considered the standard. I don't want to get into too much. Um, if, if there are specific questions, uh, I, I, I don't mind, Andy. But, you know, I, I you know, we could I could ramble on forever about liability. Um, why refer to a radiologist? Again, I, I don't do the scare tactic. I'm not saying every Every time you take a scan, you should send it to a radiologist. That's why I think these CE courses and these educational um, uh, programs that you know I try to offer is so that you become efficient enough that you can navigate a volume yourself. And then when you find that really unusual thing, then you you know maybe refer, or if you already know what kind of what it is, some really pathological, then you know where to go, or oral surgeon, oral maxillofacial surgeon. Um, so number one, physical report for the patients. Uh, I have some uh, dentists that refer to me for, you know, number one, airway, number two, uh, patients that are just high needs. There's some clinics, you know, there's some clinics out there that they just deal with those top of the top, you know, patients. Uh, they're already, you know, their teeth are perfect and they want them more perfect. Uh, the second the patient complains like, oh, why are you taking a comb beam? You know, why are you, you know, radiating me? Well, now you got a physical report to show them, hey, look, this is, it was worthwhile because these are the findings. You know, we were placing an implant. You didn't have enough bone and it was worthwhile to take it instead of, you know, challenging it without knowing that. Summary of findings. Um, you know, I, I, I can't, you know, discuss every radiologist. I am the one that I spend a lot of time on my, uh, my description. But basically, if there's an endodontically treated tooth and there's nothing wrong with it, I will still put it in there. It comes to the point where if you get a radiology report on the weekend uh, and you're not seeing the patients, you can just read it and you know exactly what's going on with that patient. What's good, what's not, you know, every tooth that's fine. You could give that uh, report now to a dental assistants and they can actually fill out Dentrix or whatever, you know, software program they have and know exactly what's going on in the oral cavity. Minus, of course, fillings, but, you know, I'm talking about, uh, you know, the, the main findings. Uh, liability, uh, this is a big one. You know, I pay a lot of money for my malpractice. Um, and that's why I do have malpractice is because uh, you refer to me uh, a volume, I'm liable for everything in it. And just to understand the difference between, you know, sharing liability versus me being fully liable is if you, you know, I, I keep on talking about third molars. If you're, you know, worried about some third molars and you don't want to challenge them and you refer to the oral maxillofacial surgeon, Whose responsibility is it now? If something went wrong, is it yours or is it the oral surgeon's? Of course, it's the oral surgeon. So it's the same thing with radiologists. Uh, just to show you really quick, just what a radiology report looks like if you've never had one. This is the airway study. Uh, you know, a lot of pictures. I worked as a dentist, um, so I understand the value of 
um, images because I was always a very visual person and I think dentistry is very visual. So I always include uh, enough images that, you know, you know, I'm not going to give you an image of, a, you know, something that's okay. I'm going to give you an image of something that's uh, a problem. Um, here's that description portion I was talking about. And this is the main part. That is all you really need to know. This is the impressions and recommendations. Now, this is the stuff that you can act on. The only reason airway is in there, if you know, uh, is because the study was for airway. So if you're asking about number three, potentially fractured, I'm not going to admit it from the, the impressions. I'm still going to tell you there was no incidental findings. Just like I'm saying here for airway, there's no findings. Now let's backtrack. So what was the point of the description? The point of the description is if you read this, the impressions recommendations, and you don't know what I'm talking about or how did I get to that diagnosis or, or whatever, you can go back to the description and see exactly the workflow of how I got to that point. To the, good enough to that point that I hope that you don't have to ever call me because all the answers should be in here. And if you have to call me after this, that means I didn't do my job that day. So, you know, everything you need to know really should be in, the, in this report, you know, from the actionable portion to description and so forth. Okay. Wait for time, Miles. Okay. All right. Navigation. So this is where we're going to go over how we're going to cover a volume. Okay. So if you guys remember something like this from dental school, so I told you my my wife is also a dentist. Uh, the first time I presented this to her, she started laughing, and I was like, "What's so funny about you know this slide?" And uh, she's like, "I don't do this." She's like, "I." <laughs> You know, there's a problem with this area. She looks at that area. But the whole point of the systematic approach, um, and, and this applies directly with looking at a cone beam and the way that you look at the volume, but the systematic approach is just like you look at a panoramic. You don't look at the area of interest right away. They're having pain on number three. You ignore that right now. You look at the TMJ. When you're looking at a panoramic, you look at the sinuses, the floor of the nasal cavity, then the whole nasal cavity. Then you look at the, uh, the bony structures of the mandible, and then the dental alveolar crest, the dental alveolar uh, region. And so that, like I just said, and I'm repeating myself, this applies, that systematic approach applies directly when we're looking at cone beam CT. And I'm going to show you my systematic approach of how I go through a volume. Now, anatomy is a tough one. I'm going to show you anatomy, but I don't want to discourage you, but going through your anatomy textbook, your netters, uh, and reading all these structures, yes, it's good to know what they're called, but those images do not translate well when you're looking at a volume. Because a volume, you're stuck with those three planes, sagittal, coronal, um, axial. Uh, everything looks a lot, lot different. Again, you know, this, this is a good refresher. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's good to know the, the, the main structures, but they don't apply directly. It's, it's really just the more times you go through a volume, you recognize structures and, uh, and you, you move forward from there. Uh, the big one that you really look for is when you're looking for normal. And, and this, is the, this is the kicker. Like I always say thin and continuous cortical outline. If there's no interruption of that bone, there's no expansion, that is what you're looking for. That's normal. The trabecular bone pattern should be within normal limits. You know, that wispy granular a trabecular bone pattern, that's normal. You know, once you get outside of that, then that becomes abnormal. Um, you know, talking about anatomy, uh, you know, what is it, six credits or something, you know, you had to do in dental school. Like it was, it was an, an extensive, but that was a full body, you know, um, and uh, you had to imagine as, you know, dental radiologists, we had to know every structure of the head and neck Inside out, I'm telling you, there, there was like maybe 15 different structures just of the Stella Tursica. Um, anyways, okay. And you can see that okay, correct? Yes, sir. It looks great. Okay. Sorry, guys. Just give me a second to set up here. Which... As I'm switching, I just want to tell you a really funny story. So, um, you know, I got a three, sorry, two and a half year old daughter, and um, it's as if they know something's going on. You know, I wasn't stressed yesterday. You know, I didn't present to my wife or anything yesterday. Uh, she's a very good sleeper. She goes to sleep on time. She sleeps the whole night. I don't remember the last time she woke up. Last night she would not, 
she must have known something was going on. It was, it was hilarious. You know, 11 o'clock at night, you know, she, she's there on the other side of the, the house and uh, she's singing, you know, storming around the kitchen. And she woke up like three times last night crying, you know, mommy, mommy, daddy, daddy, you know, wakes, we're, we're early risers. And, you know, she, she wanted to come to big bed, you know, first thing in the morning while well, she should be sleeping for another hour. So I just think it's funny that, you know, how kids can, can read that something is different, not necessarily uh, bad. Um, so I just want to go over this first. So this is really crucial. Before you even go through a volume, you should line it up so it's perfect. I use CareStream. Um, most people will use whatever software came with their Combeam CT. Some people might have some special software like Anonymage and Vivo, On Demand. Uh, you know, CareStream is my preference. Uh, everyone's going to find their own preference. This is this is mine. So lining up, I always put the axial right away along the hard palette. Boom. Okay. Then I go back here. I want to look at those condyles and the mandibular fossa. Okay, right here. This one's actually pretty much lined up. No, just a little off. So let's just line that up a little bit better. And then let's see what it looks like when we're up here. See, that's that's pretty off right there. So let's adjust it here. Again, you can see the mandibular fossa, and I'm talking about in here and the condyle within, and just, just trying to line up with that area because that area should be consistent. That should be uh, consistent by at lateral. I'm not talking about the condyles. I'm talking about the bony structures around it. The condyles, because if, you know, a lot of patients don't have perfectly symmetrical jaws, um, you know, or uh, hypodysplastic or, or whatever, um, but, you know, this, this area should look the same. You can see the uh, coronary process, you know, the, the, the uh, zygomatic arch, everything looks very symmetrical bilaterally. Okay, so let's reload this. Okay. So really quick story. So I think I was really blessed uh, and really lucky to go to UT Health San Antonio, um, used to be UTESCA uh, for oral max facial radiology. I really think, you know, they, they say, you know, the, the height of Rome, uh, I really believe I went to school there during the, the height of radiology at that program. Uh, at one point we actually had six faculty uh, teaching us. So you gotta imagine, you know, for 12 residents, you got six different people that read radiology reports that go through volumes that, you know, know physics a different way. And, you know, that I'm able now to tap into all of those and select which way I like and which way I think is the best for myself. Um, and, and so I, I think I was really lucky to be there during that time. Um, the way I go through a volume though, this, this first portion is actually um, from a oral max facial radiologist uh, that graduated many years before me, and she actually teaches a lot of anatomy and uh, very, very, very uh, smart and very good uh, educator. And that's this is the technique that she that I saw her do once, and I've I've stuck with it since. So what the, that is is we start with the coronal view, and so there's so many bones, so much things to look at. Go through the coronal and focus on one thing. Focus on everything that's black and the major structures around those black areas. And I'm, I'm, when I talk about major structures around the black areas is, you know, the, the ear area, you know. And uh, let me show you now. So we're going to be moving forward and right away. So here we go. You got the portions of the bony labyrinth. You got the internal acoustic meatus. Right here, you can see uh, uh, semi-lunar uh, channels right here. The cocula, you can see the ear ollis, sorry, ossicles, sorry, ear ollis are in fish, if you didn't know that, ossicles, um, and the external acoustic meatus right there. The pneumatization of the mastoid air cells. Everything looks normal, looks symmetrical. And right away, now we're getting into the sphenoid sinus. 
So we're going to ignore this portion that I said, everything that's black, because this is, okay. Okay. Um, because we're going to look at that in the sagittal view. So here's the sphenoid sinus moving forward. Now this is the part where we're going to start worrying about the nasal cavity. And this is right around the region. Once you start seeing the nasal cavity, you're going to start seeing the ethmoid air cells and the maxillary sinuses and everything. There's no significant soft tissue. There's no uh, expansion. The cortical outline, again, you know, I could go to this a thousand times, thin and continuous cortical outline. Trabecular bone pattern looks normal. You know, moving forward, nasal cavity, inferior medial superior nasal concha or turbinates. I don't see a concha beloza, which is, you know, a lot of people talk about. Here, very key area. This is your osteomedial complex. Is that patent, especially if you're doing sinuses in the maxilla and there's not a lot of bone. Right here, this is this bilaterally, this is your uh, inferior orbital canal. Still no abnormality and going to your anterior nares. Okay. It's going on corona, uh, sagittal view. Going back and forth. So looking at the cervical spine, you know, there's no abnormalities. These are the bodies of the cervical vertebrae. This is your dense process. This is your anterior arch. This all looks normal. Sometimes it looks all junky, but it's usually in a, uh, you know, older demographic. Uh, here, oops. Here's your articular facets or faucets, whatever you want to call it. Uh, you know, same thing, no abnormalities. This is where you're going to see some degenerative disease or degenerative uh, findings or remodeling in the cervical vertebrae in older uh, uh, demographics. And here you see the hyoid bone. This is a very crucial area here, very crucial. If there's something going on with the back of the sinus or in, or in, in this area, uh, of the uh, of, of the sphenoid, spe anyways, um, this is a really crucial area. So this is your uh, pterygopalatine uh, fossa, which is where your pterygomaxillary fissure feeds into. There's a lot of structures that go through here, and it exits your greater palatine foramen, right there. That's a very crucial area. So that's something you should always keep an eye on in, in sagittal, axial, uh, especially if you have something going on in that area. All right. Uh, airway real quick. Mid-sagittal view. Lingual tonsils will be located here. Even though the tongue's not in the ideal situation, you can see that there's no enlargements. This is where your adenoids are going to be, your pharyngeal uh, tonsils. Let's go right into the axial. So now let's go to the area where you're going to see your, here, there, you don't see any convexity because that's where you're going to have your palatine tonsils. So, you know, not, nothing going on with the tonsils in this patient's airway is very patent. Um, and the final big step, which I always leave to the end, is of course, going through the dentition. Um, everyone has their own technique. I absolutely prefer going through um, the axial, I, I find on average, I'll have more findings in the axial than I do um, with sagittal or people will do the reconstructed uh, panoramic and go that way. But here you can see all the apices. Of the mandible, no abnormalities. Let's go through the apices of the maxilla. There's your canines, and moving forward. Number 15 is endodontically treated. Something's going on here, but this is just unusual trabecular bone pattern. I wouldn't even call that a periapical scar. Absolutely not a periapical lesion. Um, now it's 154, so I'll just show you this last step. We'll, uh, you know. Uh, if there's a lot of interest in this, you know, I definitely could do more on the anatomy, especially when it gets to the TMJ. Uh, the one thing I wanted to make a note of is uh, when you do fill out the uh, review form or whatever it's called, um, Andy's going to mention it again, but maybe in the comments, um, other than, you know, that you wish I was in person, um, maybe mention what other topics you would like to hear from or what you would like me to focus on more. 
you know, of course, we're going to be doing a lot of pathology, but, you know, do you want to know more about airway? Do you want to know more about TMJ? Um, I uh, definitely consider myself subspecialized in airway. Um, I've taken this year probably 50 CE courses or CE credits for airway. I was part of the uh, Houston Consortium, which was a three-day intensive course uh, two, three weeks ago. Uh, I was the one, I was in uh, another one that was in uh, Colorado uh, online. Um, so, you know, if, if there's anything that you guys feel like you want a little bit more focus on, either, you know, email me personally, uh, message maybe Andy that you want me to give you a call or just, you know, make it in the comment box of, of a topic that you'd really want me to, to focus on more. Uh, I, I feel absolutely no problem doing that. So we actually have uh, quite a few requests to keep going if you still have some time. Um, so what we can do now is um, there were a couple of questions that um, I put on hold since they were about previous slides that you went over. So um, sorry, okay. and then a couple of questions about um, identifying a uh, certain anatomy on the little demo that you're doing right now, as well as um, I think some of them uh, kind of wanted you to go through the systematic approach, maybe a little bit slower. Um, so it's up to you whether you kind of want to wrap up this demonstration first or if you want to open it up for a little bit of Q&A. Well, the people that would like that systematic approach, you know, are they interested in doing another session? Because I have no problem doing it again. But if they want this a private session um, where it's not as delayed, potentially, um, you know, we could do a go to meeting. So in that case, um, we'll kind of leave it open if um, if you're interested in having a separate session just for um, really going through the systematic approach and breaking down different things to look for and the kind of things that as a radiologist, Dr. Morchad is evaluating as he scrolls through the CBCT, definitely just shoot us a comment and we can go ahead and set that up as a separate session. Um, in the meantime, uh, let's go ahead and answer a couple questions that we were receiving throughout the presentation. The, the first is someone asked, what is the KVP ranges you recommend for an adult? That's <clears throat> that's pretty difficult to answer exactly. Um, just because every machine is slightly different. Um, I, I'll tell you right now, we, we have a VATEC here and for an adult, it's between 70 and, and 90. Uh, but the new CareStream 9600 uh, that the, the new one that just came out, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not plugging CareStream at all, but it's it's the most powerful thing out there. Uh, it's blasting around 1, 100, 120 kvp. It really depends on your machine. If you knew what the set is on your machine, um, let's let's say our Vatec uh, for a normal adults man is 70 kvp. If you're taking a once someone that has a lot of uh, restorations. I would feel comfortable putting it up to 80. Awesome. Great. Um, another question we have is um, asking, is TMJ remodeling actually evidence of TMJ damage? Apparently, a lot of the reports uh, they're getting seems to imply that it's normal to have TMJ remodeling. Absolutely. And again, uh, there's a lot of factors that are in, you know, part of this. Uh, if, it's, if you see significant remodeling in a 20-year-old, then yes, there is a problem. Um, the, the big issue with TMJ, it was such a hot topic. Like, you know, airway is a hot topic now. You know, five, 10 years ago, it was airway. Uh, sorry, yeah, TMJ. The problem is that we found that if you look at research, most TMJ problems, it's going to be that, you know, under 26 female, that it's going to resolve on its own. Now, if you're in the 30s, 40s, 50s, uh, and you still have that, you know, significant remodeling, then that might be evidence of previous degenerative disease. You know, some of the stuff is... You know, you, you don't know what happened, you know, and, and the problem is, and I, you know, I don't want to get too political about this, but, you know, patients do lie, you know, um, you know, they, they'll never tell you the exact truth. And so, you know, they, they might say, no, I never had an appliance. Well, they didn't know that maybe their night guard was a considered appliance uh, and that night guard was enough, you know, to get them out of that, you know, strong occlusion grinding at night that, you know, allowed their TMJ just to have that period of time just to, to heal. So. Um, I hope that answered the question because actually, I'm sorry, in, in my spiel, I, I forgot what the question was. Oh, is remodeling? Uh, yes, re I'm going to say remodeling is normal because what you're concerned about is if there's significant osteophyte formation and subchondral cysts, and that, that is considered active, 
degenerative um, issues. Okay, awesome. And we did have a question over one of the PAs that you were showing. Um, it was asked after you had already moved on to another slide. So if you have a moment, if you could go ahead and switch back to the PowerPoint, um, back to those images. Oh, tab. Which one was it? I believe it was, this was the first case you presented, correct? I believe it was over the, the second case. Yeah, this is the second case. I, there, it's, there's two cases. The second case has two portions to it. The first case did not have PAs. Okay, so it was the case with the, the PAs. They asked, um, was the PA CBCT showing a radiolucent mass around the upper left, or is that the maxillary sinus extending that far over? Are we? So this is okay. We're, we're, oh, yeah, oh, in the PA, in the PA. Give me one second. I, that, I believe they're addressing the um, the scan in general, not necessarily just the PA. Um, but he's wanting to specify whether that's a radiolucent mass or is it just the, the the maxillary sinus extending kind of in the area of number twelve? Yeah, it's of number twelve. Let me go back. No, it, it's definitely not a mass. Um, it, it's, it's not a mass. It, it's just part of the, the sinus. It's just interesting that you bring up the, you know, a maxillary sinus can reach all the way to number sign 12. Uh, I wish I part added it to this presentation, but there's a case that I still have not been able to uh, solve for the last four years because the patient has severe uncontrolled diabetes to get biopsy, but uh, they have this weird le lesion over their number sign uh, 12, actually over 11, and it was all because of a bone graft uh, because they had severe, severe pneumatized uh, maxillary sinuses. But but no, that none of these cases have a, a mass in the sinus. So it would just be the sinus. So another question we have is, uh, how does the CBCT provide more diagnostic information for TMD versus MRI? There are two total different modalities, like absolutely different. Um, great, great question, by the way. Um, th this is something that I am, I'm, I'm going to steal your question and add it to my presentation. Um, with CBCT, number one, um, you're looking at just the bony structures. So you can see the changes in, you know, the bone. You can see the cortical outline. Um, you can see the trabecular bone pattern. Is it sclerotic or not? You're really assessing what's happening to the bone. The MRI is not that great at looking at bone, but you can see all the soft tissue now. Cone beam CT is awful at looking at soft tissue. So MRI, you're going to see the disc. You're going to see all of the, uh, the ligaments. You're going to see all of those things. So uh, if there is... Uh, you know, severe pain in the, the condyles. And, and this has happened a, a few times, you know, I'm, I'm going to say two, three times a year, you know, I get referred a patient that has severe, severe TMJ problems. There's nothing else going on. Same thing, younger, uh, uh, you know, you know, in the 20 year old range and condyles look absolutely perfect. That, that is immediate to me referrals for uh, MRI, assess what's going on with the, with the, uh, the TM, uh, with the soft tissue. A great question. Okay, and so um, for everyone asking about uh, a little bit more demonstration as far as identifying patholo pathology and you know abnormal anatomy and things like that, that is what the next three sessions are going to be over. Um, Dr. Morchat. Yeah, I, I, sorry, Andy. I, yeah, I really it was very difficult for me to do it because I you know there's so many areas that I can point out that there is always an abnormality in that area, and that's. That's why we had to separate the two sessions because abnormalities and incidental findings, that, that's a huge, huge section. And, and if you become really familiar with those abnormalities and incidental findings, so not pathology, but just abnormalities, incidental findings, and if you become familiar, then that's going to make you a lot more confidence uh, going through a volume. Absolutely.
Yeah. So, so concerns in regards to, to those topics. Um, that's why we have the next three sessions kind of split into level one, two, and three. One are going to be kind of uh, very common findings. And obviously the subsequent uh, sessions are going to scale up to a little bit trickier and a little bit more out there findings in pathology. Uh, that being said, we, we do have a lot of interest um, and a lot of people still logged in and interested in continuing to, uh, to participate. So um, if you could go through kind of the systematic approach with your live CBCT once again, um, and just okay. kind of go through that approach, approach a little bit slower, we have some questions about, um, you know, identifying the nerve as you go through there, and then also specifically um, what kind of things you're looking for um, in the TMJ. And again, I, I, I was really hoping to cover the TMJ with the abnormalities. That, that's a big topic. TMJ is huge. Okay. I, I would love to do it today, but that's that's like I'm, I'm telling that's going to be another 20 minutes because there's a there's a lot of structures. Uh, if if you ever get one of my reports, uh, you'd be surprised. You know, airway I can summarize in one or two sentences, but the description of the TMJ, you know, I'm, I'm going to say it, it. Sometimes it gets to about half a page because there's there's a lot a lot going on there, especially with um, you know. There's, there's a lot of, you know, top radiologists out there that sp spent a lot of time and a lot of research in the TMJ area that, you know, we, you know, we, we really as, as oral radiologists, you know, or some oral radiologists find themselves that subspecialty, you know, I subspecialize in the airway, subspecialize just in TMJ. There's a lot of knowledge up there. So I, I'd love to do it, but I, I can, we can make that another topic. I'd love to do it. Yeah, great, great. So we, we do have a couple of questions about, um, because right now, I think you're scrolling through the systematic approach with the goal of um, talking about what you are potentially identifying in um, in each uh, sector of the scan. But we do have a couple questions just about general navigation. So maybe if you can talk about the different views, the axial, the coronal, the cross section, and I guess what kind of um, di diagnostic values each one of those views can potentially provide. So the one great thing about being, you know, working with CBCT uh, is that we do have the capability to see all of these three views. And even the fourth being, you know, the reconstructed 3D, um, you know, as a resident, we actually had to work. I, I'm going to say it was up to six months with a different radiology field. So two months or one or two months just with the. Um, uh, neural radiologists and they're stuck with just looking at the axial they have to be perfect at just looking at the axial knowing all anatomy uh we're kind of spoiled because we have the multi-planar view broken down for us um so so i'll give you a quick summary I, i'm not even scroll through it but you know if, and this is you know a slide I, I should make this is actually a great idea So, you know, there, there's a lot of anatomical structures, but, you know, just as a quick review. So in uh, the coronal view here, so both coronal and sagittal, you're looking at the cervical vertebrae. Um, most anatomy, I find you're going to find in the coronal. So you're going to be looking at, you know, the zygomatic arch for bone. Uh, you're looking at the ear uh, areas. Um, I will scroll, you know, the foramen rotundum, we can even move back. Here's, you know, the, um, the jugular comes through here, right here. So that, you know, you're only going to see good views of that with the coronal view. Um, again, the cervical vertebrae, this is a great view to, to see. This is where you're going to see ossified formation or remodeling or even degenerative disease. Uh, ears, of course, is the best for the coronal. Uh, when it comes to like the dense process and degeneration in this area with the anterior arch, that would be your uh, sagittal view would be the best. Um, sagittal view is also better for finding if there is stylohyoid ligament calcification. This is your styloid process. Condyles, I just ignore. You know, I, I look at that at the sagittal view. And if there's any findings, I immediately go to this view here, and I'll just give you a quick teaser. You know, uh, people ask, you know, why use different kind of software? Again, I, you know, you can choose what you want. 
Uh, I just really find that CareStream is the most intuitive. But you know, here I can break it down really quick to three cross sections. Watch how fast this is. I guess just stand closer. You know, that's that's everything you need to know right there. Boom, done. And it looks it looks perfect. Um, so continuing with the coronal. Uh, that's the main area where I'm looking for the nasal cavity. Uh, moving forward from the nasal cavity right here, the sphenoid sinus, you're going to see two round areas. Um, one is the Vidian canal. There's two terms for it. Vidian is the one I know. Um, and it's always lower than the, um, oh my goodness, uh, foramen rotundum. is going to be a little bit higher. And those are, those are findings that you want to look for because I, I I have this very specific case that, you know, I was just scrolling through it and all of a sudden, you know, the foramen rotundum was huge, absolutely huge. I, I haven't got a biopsy back. It was, it was just really, I'm going to say January, uh, what it was, but, you know, something pathological, something tumoral, you know, um, could have been a lipoma. I, I don't know, you know, but uh, definitely, you know, something very significant. And that's why it's important to go you know, looking through these areas. Um, Right here, important structure. That's your infraorbital fissure. Um, cell of tersica, you're going to find that on your sagittal. Again, majority, I'm looking at the coronal for most structures. You know, is there, you know, a fracture? Um, again, you know, even a fracture you might even find more easily on the 3D reconstruction. Not 3D reconstruction, sorry, the uh, reconstructed panoramic view. You know, I I include this to every, every report I do. I still consider this the gold standard. Um, this is what I'm familiar with. So this is what I always have to give because um, the the Reconstructed panoramic view, you know, you're going to get your condyles in here. You're going to get, excuse me, a general idea of the sinuses, the nasal cavity, the orbits. You're not seeing any fractures or anything. And the whole summary of the um, oral cavity. Um I'm just trying to think of more anatomy that I look for. We already discussed the nasal cavity and everything. Um, again, you know, really looking at, the key thing is when you're, most of your patients are going to be normal. So that's what you're just looking for. So you, you really need to make the volume within your screen symmetrical so that everything looks symmetrical. And from there, you just scroll back and forth. And if everything continues being symmetrical, like look, you know, like psychomotor arches are, are, are normal on both sides. You know, the orbit, orbital, uh, the orbits, you know, same thing, look normal. 